from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. Welcome to the Library of Congress. This is a very familiar place to many of you, but we're so delighted to see such a robust turnout for this event, uh, Mapping the Wilderness of Knowledge, the card catalog, past, present, and future. This uh, event is being uh, recorded for future webcasting, so please take a moment, if you haven't already, to silence your phone or tablet or device of your choice. My name is Becky Brasington-Clark. I'm the director of the General Publishing Office at the Library of Congress. Our office is charged with promoting the library's collections and scholarship through the publication of books and other products. Today's program was inspired by the release of a new book, this one, The Card Catalog, Books, Cards, and Literary Treasures, written by my colleague Pete Devereaux, co-published by Chronicle Books in association with the Library of Congress. Pete will kick off this afternoon's program with a broad history of the card catalog, featuring highlights from the book. He will then turn the program over to Beecher Wiggins, the library's director for acquisitions and bibliographic access, who will then introduce and join our stellar lineup of speakers. I hope you'll join us immediately following the program for the reception and book signing. Uh, books are for sale out in the foyer and we'll do the signing out there as well. We do have coffee, tea, and cake, and if you haven't seen it, it's not just any cake, it's a card catalog cake, so we're geeking out on that. Uh, before we begin, I would like to offer sincere thanks to Beecher and his colleague Susan Morris for developing this program and supporting the participation of our out-of-town speakers. I'd also like to thank our co-publisher, Chronicle Books, whose generous support made this event possible. Thanks very much to Wanda Cartwright and her colleagues in the Special Events Office, and extra special thanks to Publishing Office colleagues Hannah Fries, who managed every detail of this process with enthusiasm, efficiency, and good humor, and Marietta Sharperson, who navigated us through some last-minute administrative mazes. Uh, on the fly here, I want to thank Dwight and Keith and Blaine and all the other chair herders for stepping up to the plate and just getting some extra chairs on the floor. Thank you very much. Now I'd like to introduce Pete Devereaux, a writer, editor in the publishing office and author of the card catalog. Pete's career was launched in the scholarly publishing sector where he worked for Lippincott, Williams, and Wilkins. He left Lippincott to become a librarian at the Enoch Pratt Free Library where he had the pr privilege of working alongside Carla Hayden. Upon joining the Library of Congress publishing office in 2012, Pete brought together his publishing and library experience. He's contributed to or edited six additional books for the library, and we are really fortunate to call him our colleague. Thank you very much, Pete Devereaux. Okay. Well, thanks, Becky. Uh, it's an honor to be here with my uh, esteemed colleagues from the cataloging community. I'd also like to uh, thank Hannah from the publishing office for helping put this event together. This book was a great opportunity to tell a story about an unheralded yet extremely important part of libraries, the card catalog, one of the most versatile and durable technologies in history. The reality is most card catalogs are long gone. I'm not sure how many people realize what a massive and unprecedented undertaking it was. So I hope people will pick the book up and read about the history and the continued importance of cataloging here at the Library of Congress. So what I'd like to do is briefly run through a fairly brisk and general history of cataloging and a progression towards the Library of Congress's card catalog. When I started research for this book, I struggled a little bit with finding a starting point that made sense. After reading about Sumerian historian S.N. Kramer, I understood the story really started at the dawn of civilization. He clearly identified one cuneiform tablet found near the ruins of Nippur, dated around 2000 BC, as being used for cataloging purposes. At just two and a half by one and a half inches, the tablet foreshadowed the use of small index cards. It was divided into two columns, listing the titles of 62 literary works, including the Epic of Gilgamesh. From Mesopotamia, the next stop is the ancient library of Alexandria, where the collection consisted of papyrus scrolls. 
Organizing the library proved very difficult as scrolls had no title page, table contents, or even author listed. The Greek poet and scholar Calamachus was chosen to devise a way to provide access. His cataloging of the scrolls, called the Penaics, made him one of the most important figures in library history. He completed around 250 BC, it was arguably the first time anyone made a sophisticated list of authors and their works. From the surviving fragments, scholars deduced the scrolls were divided into separate classes such as poetry, philosophy, and law, and then further subdivided into a narrow range of subjects. Moving ahead some 1,700 years, once Gutenberg's printing press was established, books spread quickly across the continents. As publishing grew, there emerged a uniformity in the layout and design of books. Title pages, table of contents, and other conventional elements started to appear. As it applied to cataloging, this information was a game changer. Though the staggering number of books being printed was unexpected, and ancient libraries during the Renaissance struggled to keep up. Rising to the challenge, Swiss bibliographer Conrad Gessner brought cataloging into the modern era with his ambitious attempt at compiling a list of all Latin, Greek, and Hebrew books in print. Gessner spent years traveling around Europe visiting libraries, collecting booksellers, and publishers lists. In 1545, the first volume of his Bibliotheca Universalis, the Universal Library, was published. It included an exhaustive alphabetical listing of over 2,000 authors and titles. The work established Gessner as the father of bibliography. So what many consider the first national library card catalog happened during the chaos of the French Revolution. In 1791, the assembly issued instructions to local officials to begin cataloging libraries that had been confiscated from exiled or executed aristocrats. The method relied on playing cards, which were then blank on one side. Playing cards were a perfect choice. They could be purchased throughout France, they were sturdy and roughly the same size no matter what brand, and they could easily be interfiled. Within three years, over a million cards were sent to the overwhelmed offices in Paris. The original books of the Library of Congress did not survive for long. The collection went up in flames just 14 years after they were acquired when the British ransacked Washington in 1814, torching the White House and Capitol. When news of the fire reached former President Thomas Jefferson, he wrote to a friend in Congress and offered to sell his personal library. Jefferson adapted his cataloging scheme from Sir Francis Bacon's system that started with three main categories, memory, reason, and imagination, later modified by Jefferson to history, philosophy, and fine arts. These categories were broken down further into 44 distinct chapters that fully encompassed the entire collection. By the mid-1800s, major developments were happening in the library community, led by Smithsonian librarian Charles Jouett, who sought to, quote, form a general catalog of all the books in the country with reference to libraries where each might be found. At Harvard, assistant librarian Ezra Abbott is actually credited with creating the first modern card catalog. His associate was Charles Cutter, who became librarian of the Boston Anthenaeum in 1868. There, Cutter created a new scheme that would later help establish the basis for the Library of Congress classification system. Though Cutter's cataloging rules were adopted by many libraries, he is overshadowed by his occasional rival, Melville Dewey, whose approach to cataloging was based on a control vocabulary represented by numerical values that could be subdivided by decimals. It immediately caught on and expanded Dewey's influence within the library community. Around this time, Ainsworth Rand Spotford became the sixth librarian of Congress, and his approach to cataloging and managing the growing collection was much more idiosyncratic than the emerging trends in professional librarianship. In his view, quote, the organization of a library is a subjective one. I think the best system in classifying a library is that which produces a book in the shortest time. And this is a great picture of the old library in the capital of the chaotic scene that uh, rumor has it only Spotford could find the books, so. <laughs> this quote from Spotford stood in direct contrast to librarians that signed on as charter members of the American Library Association. 
The first issue of its official publication made clear the most pressing issues facing libraries was the lack of a standardized catalog. For Dewey and the ALA, establishing these standards was only half the battle. With the growing number of libraries across the country, they advocated for a cooperative cataloging agency that would issue cards from a central location. And the newly expanded Library of Congress seemed the natural fit to take the lead. Shortly after opening the new library building, Herbert Putnam became librarian in 1899, and J.C.M. Hansen and Charles Martell were appointed to lead the new cataloging division. They confronted a collection of more than 800,000 books, hardly any of which had been cataloged by subject. Hansen later wrote that, when faced with this incredible job, quote, there was no printed or written rules no definitive verbal instructions. Apparently, it would be part of the wisdom to cut loose from the old catalog altogether. It was therefore decided to begin an entirely new catalog on standard sized cards, three by five inches. With the larger staff, catalogers created a new classification system inspired by Cuddy and Dewey, as well as integrating a new system of subject headings. In 1901, with its own dedicated branch of the printing office in the basement, and equipped with new linotype machines, the library began to crank out cards at a rate of 225 titles a day and nearly 70,000 a year. The titles were printed on the best linen ledger stock, 40 cards to a sheet. They were then cut into bindery to the index size and a hole was punched in the bottom for the guardrail. Upstairs, the cataloging division worked long, hard hours doing the tedious work of classifying, proofing, revising, sorting, and filing the millions of cards. On October 28, 1901, more than half a century after Jouett suggested the federal government centralize the printing and distribution of catalog cards, Putnam sent a memo to more than 400 libraries announcing the sale of its printed catalog cards. In 1976, former librarian, of, former librarian of Congress cataloger and historian Paul Edlin wrote, quote, few libraries have been untouched by the work done by library staff members over the years. It would be difficult to walk into a library anywhere in the United States and be unable to find one of these physical byproducts of the intellectual efforts of the cataloging staff of the Library of Congress. I think that's an appropriate quote when introducing our next speaker. Beecher Wiggins is the Director for Acquisitions and Bibliographic Access at the Library of Congress. He's been with the library since 1972 and his present position since 2004. He has been an active member of the American Library Association and the ALCTS division of ALA for more than 30 years. And he recently was the winner of the 2013 Melville Dewey Medal Award, sponsored by OCLC. Beecher. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, it's great to see you. and. Um, I have to say, I was given thanks for helping and being cooperative with this program, and that's really all it was, because all thanks go to Susan, who was arranging this while I was on travel um, this year, and so I'm just doing what I was told to do, <laughs> uh, even to the name of uh, the very brief remarks I'm going to make, the good, the bad, and the ugly. I'm not sure I would have used any of those. Um, for any number of reasons, but hey, I tried to stick to the plan, uh, which may be a reason I've been around so long. <laughs> now, uh, it, it is obvious that um, while I'm snow-capped, and I think you probably can do deductions that I've been around a while for, in fact, yesterday um, I received or was observed the 45th anniversary um, ceremony here. Um, I'm not so old that I was actually there and a part of the market development. <laughs> so I want to get that straight up front. So now that we clarified that point, my memories are going to be and my remarks are going to be uh, vicarious uh, in nature and not because I was there. But I did have the privilege of working with Henriette Davidson Avram um, for five years as her special assistant. And so, you, as you might expect, I gleaned a lot from that uh, experience uh, in any number of ways that have helped me in the following years. Now, so I heard a lot directly from her uh, as she orchestrated the development of Mark and uh, 
automating the card catalog, which we are here today celebrating. In 1989, Lucia J. Rather, uh, who was then LC's director for cataloging, and I, who at that time was the special assistant to Henriette, who was the assistant librarian for Library of Congress Processing Services, uh, Lucia and I wrote an article for, li for American Libraries uh, entitled Mark, Mrs. Avram's Remarkable Contribution. In preparing that article allowed uh, Henriette then to have time to reminisce with Lucia and me about the development of Mark, um, about her involvement and her assessment of Mark's evolution and the transformation of libraries for technical services, for public services librarians, and for catalog users everywhere and of every ilk. Now, the good. When appointed to LC, uh, Henriette quickly recognized that the most cru crucial aspect of library automation was to devise a standard vehicle for the communication of bibliographic data. The culmination of Henriette's work was among several, several lasting contributions was a format structure that became the basis for MARC formats worldwide and the MARC distribution service, a prototype that other national bibliographic agencies uh, emulated. That same prototype, the Mark Distribution Service, also gave rise to the creation of bibliographic utilities, uh, the foremost today being OCLC. In fact, OCLC might have been here at LC had Henriette gotten her way. Uh, as, forceful, as forceful as she was, she wasn't quite able to pull that one off, but we'll talk about that a bit in a minute. Um, another technical achievement was a process of format recognition. Uh, that is a technique to enable the computer to assign tags, indicators, subfield codes, fixed field codes to machine readable records um, from catalog cards. Format recognition has been hailed as one of the early examples, in fact, of an expert or a thinking system, uh, all due to Henriette's foresight. Now, the bad. Henriette viewed the recon, that is, retrospective conversion of catalog cards uh, to mark data uh, component as one of the great missed opportunities for libraries in the development of mark. That the library community did not marshal its resources to convert all of LC's records at that time, dating from 1898 to machine readable form, would have advanced libraries immeasurably. Without doing so, libraries converted the same records with high costs and varying levels of quality, which ended up being a disservice to library users everywhere. In fact, libraries across the country, including LC, and we're working on some now, and I'm looking at colleagues who have uh, stewardship of some that we need to do, uh, are still converting card catalogs and other manual files uh, that are in need of conversion. So just think about that. That was 50 years ago, and we're still diddling about with um, some hidden um, connections to our deep resources. The ugly. When asked what she would do differently in creating Mark, Henriette responded that for the LC Mark system, she would not have designed a separate application for each form of material. For those of us who were around, and I have to admit I was, uh, Mark rolled out with uh, monographs, serials of print materials, then it went to various formats, and in fact, I think it was to, into 19, early 1990s before we had all of the formats ready and we were no longer transcribing information on sheets and cards, et cetera. That failure necessitated format integration in later years uh, of the MARC's implementation and use. Now, so as not to close on the bad, uh, I'll share a tidbit on how Henriette, who was not educated as a librarian, which fooled many people, uh, how she absorbed cataloging to such a degree that she could develop Mark and ultimately she could be recognized as one of the world's preeminent librarians. She was taught cataloging through reading and studying cataloging rules um, and also by two Library of Congress staff at the time. One, a seasoned librarian. Is Kay Giles in the audience? That is he. And 
<laughs> along with a reference librarian. So you had on the one hand someone who knew how to create the data that went into catalog cards, and then you had one on the other hand who knew how to use and research that. So she wanted to make sure what she was doing was going to be the uh, full ticket. Um, so in addition to her bedtime reading of the cataloging rules, which I understand she did on a nightly basis from what she told me, then she had these two colleagues who were working with her daily. Um, I'm told that one of the learning tools that she used was a large facsimile catalog card. She placed it on the floor and she pranced um, top to bottom, left to right, and absorbing each element of the card, asking Kay questions of what should be there and what should not be there. And when he couldn't answer, he said, well, if we did it, there must have been a reason for having it, so you need to figure out how to put it into the format. <laughs> so with that, I say long live the card catalog and its vaunted legacy, even as we look forward to its replacement bib frame, which I won't go into because I've talked about that to most of you, I think. And I think our colleague will cover a bit of that uh, in a special format. So thank you for your attention to my remarks. Now I'm simply going to go down the uh, days to and introduce each of the colleagues, every one of them I've worked with, but I'm not going through much uh, introductory remarks except to let you know who they are and what their um, current positions are. Um, the first will be Barbara Natanson, who works uh, as head of the reference, uh, head of reference in prints and photographs divisions here at the Library of Congress. And I work with Barbara on in numerous occasions um, as we come together with both um, guidance on processing materials as well as the contents of prints and photographs. Um, then next to her is a colleague from outside the library, Christopher Cronin, who is Director of Technical Services at the University of uh, Chicago, and I work with Chris on both PCC, he's a former PCC chair, and I work with him on the um, so-called Big Heads group at ALA, so we have a good long working relationship. Uh, next to him is Kathy Woodrell, who is here at the Library of Congress and is a reference specialist uh, in decorative arts and architecture in the main reading room, and I work with her on many occasions, including some of our mentoring programs and other areas. And then last, but certainly not least, is uh, Jennifer Baxmeyer, who is the leader uh, at Serials and Electronic Resources team at Princeton University. And I've had the privilege of working with her both um, as we are rolling out BIPFRAME and uh, in the OCLC, or, well, we don't say RLG anymore, the OCLC yeah. Partners Group uh, at ALA. So these are our um, wonderful speakers this afternoon, and we're simply going in order. And at the end of the presentations, We'll have time for questions, comments, and um, your thoughts on today's sessions. So, Barbara. Let's see if I can pull this down. I feel like saying, can you see me now? <laughs> oh, sorry. Yes, <laughs> I also wanted to thank the organizers for this program, which uh, gave me a chance to revisit um, my life with the card catalog. I see in the program that I'm listed as talking about the card catalog as early technology, and that probably should be as my early technology. Um, I handled a lot of catalog cards in my early career in the prints and photographs division, but as you'll see, I think I'm going to argue that the card catalog was really an advance in technology. Uh, with all of its uh, benefits and, and deficiencies, the catalog helps us to envision multiple aspects of access to a large picture collection. So, let's see what we've got here. So the Prints and Photographs Division has a proud tradition of using card catalogs. We once counted 40 different card catalogs and indexes in use in the division. At this point, we've converted much of that data into online records, but there's still card catalogs in regular use in our reading room. In the history of access to prints and photographs division collections, card catalogs represented a flexible, cost-effective form of access when compared with other access methods that had their benefits, but also considerable drawbacks. With picture research in particular, users often don't know what they want until they see it. 
The contents of a picture and more indefinable aspects of the composition are especially crucial in the selection stage of searching. So one of the means of access implemented in the early days of the prints and photographs division was to place the pictures in files for browsing. Direct, effective, satisfying. But unless one could invest the money and space needed to file multiple copies of the images under different headings, it also meant deciding on the one element of an image that seemed most prominent, most likely to be sought. If it's a picture of Calamity Jane, for instance, probably anyone wanting to know what the Frontier Scout and Wild West show performer looked like would be pleased to find this picture under her name once one figures out which of her many names she went by and what you should look under. <laughs> but there are other elements of the picture that could also be of interest. The setting, which turns out to be the grounds of the uh, Pan American Exposition in Buffalo, New York in 1901. The photographer and copyright holder, C.D. Arnold. Even the horse. Researchers studying the exposition or the photographic techniques of C.D. Arnold or horses used in entertainments at the turn of the 20th century would miss out. The handy three by five card bearing a description of the image and filed under multiple access points opened new paths for research. This point may seem obvious, but filing descriptions in a card catalog also promoted collocation. We had to deliberately include a name heading or a subject heading to file under, and with well-established principles of authority control, consistent use of headings enabled the user to count on all of the photographs of Martha Canary to be, Canary to be listed together. And cross-references could easily be built in to lead from her better-known name, Calamity Jane, to the authorized heading at the time. But a heading that has since changed in the LC name authority file where the authorized name is now Calamity Jane. This demonstration that in cataloging, as in life, changes ceaseless also illustrates that with each new technology comes new challenges. Cross references were easy to build in, not so easy to maintain, a point I'll return to in a minute. But back to my salute to the flexibility of the card catalog. One feature that was exploited to the fullest in our reading room is that staff organized the contents of each catalog devoted to a particular pictorial format in a way that made the most sense for the items they led to. While author, title, subject catalogs are the norm, with our fine prints, for instance, the entries are organized by century and within that by the name of the artist. Talk about visualization. Just a glance at the drawers gives a sense of the bulk dates of our collection. Since staff could record all kinds of information on a three by five card, in this catalog, staff went beyond mere cross references to incorporate the authority record itself with all the research it represented. And lest you think that we traded the, you know it when you see it element of access solely for word headings, I'll point out that with our historical print collection, we revived the notion that seeing the picture as early in the search process as possible is a vast aid to research. Did the fabulous three by five card technology solve all of our access problems? What am I gonna say? No. no. <laughs> Just imagine how labor intensive it was to paste those little pictures on the cards. <laughs> Combine that with the work involved in producing multiple cards, adding headings to them, and filing them. And maintaining headings and cross-references with changing cataloging rules was also a challenge. And the results could be pretty <laughs> messy in the absence of training in library hand. With a growing collection that now totals nearly 16 million items, even when we described on a single card, an entire group of images rather than describing the items one by one, the labor involved meant that <clears throat> there were thousands of images that didn't even get this level of description, not to mention the physical preparation that would be needed to make it possible to serve the materials being described. Digitization and machine-readable cataloging enabled us to describe, index, and display images in far greater quantity with far greater speed and ease and enabled a correspondingly greater speed and ease in the searching end. Keyword access to all the words in the records, whether headings or not, took the pressure off of the analysis and precision required to assign authorized headings 
and the maintenance that comes with that. Although we are still big believers in authority control and controlled vocabulary, we assess collections to determine what level of cataloging can practically be applied in light of the likely use of the images and other characteristics of the material. Sometimes that means relying on words found in various parts of the description, as in these catalog records for images relating to the Pan American Exposition. Catalog records for some materials consist, at least initially, primarily of information that came on or with the items, generally recorded as a transcribed title. That's the case, for instance, with our 35,000 glass negatives from the National Photo Company collection. The transcription provides searchable words, but we've lost some of the benefits of collocation, that one-stop shopping satisfaction of knowing you found all the relevant entries under the authorized name or subject heading. Therefore, we must remind searchers to think of the different ways names can be spelled and expressed. Similarly, it's important to think of synonyms that might have been used for a topic and to think about the words that might have been current in the 1910s and 1920s when the images were made and captioned. For the researcher interested in early auto travel, think roadsters, not our standard subject heading of automobiles. As you can see, sometimes, particularly with large collections of negatives, very few words come with an item, and sometimes none at all. To provide maximum access as immediately as possible, we take advantage of digital visual access in a way that the card catalog couldn't have readily provided. Related images are often physically next to each other in the collection. Exposing that arrangement offers an added form of access. Here, someone interested in auto racing at the Baltimore Washington Speedway in Laurel would probably be delighted to find this uncaptioned photo beside one that had a basic caption that mentions the location and date. Do you suppose there's a metaphor somewhere in the fact that I've switched modes of transportation from Calamity Jane's horse to speeding cars of the early 20th century? Electronic data and digital technology have expanded exponentially the universe of what we can make available from our vast and varied collections. But in my final ode to the card catalog, I'll note that there was an intangible, or maybe entirely tangible, quality that came with being able to see the size and scope of a card catalog. You had a physical sense of the universe of data you were searching. With many of our online systems, it's now harder to get a sense of the whole, the pool of data one is searching. So it becomes more challenging to figure out whether one's search has been truly comprehensive. Helping researchers to picture the information universe we're presenting and how to navigate that universe is part of our ongoing mission. Thank you. The microphones are going to go like this all day. Um, well, thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, Susan asked me uh, to talk about how the University of Chicago built its catalog, uh, particularly around its distinctive area studies collections, um, and in particular, Cyrillic uh, uh, languages, uh, uh, or scripts, rather. And, um, I imagine I was asked also because of my connection to the cataloging community and the PCC, but I have to confess I, did ne I never cataloged uh, in Cyrillic scripts myself. So my solution to this, how to develop a presentation on something I have no personal experience with, um, uh, was to talk to my colleagues, many of whom in technical services um, were around when we managed the card catalog, um, and also some members of, of our collection development team. Um, and what they told me, um, interestingly, um, even though I talked to all of them independently and separately, came, came into uh, several kind of recurring um, themes, and some of them we've already heard a little bit about. And the first was how the card catalog over time um, reflected histories of our language. And, um, our, our Slavic and Eastern European Studies uh, bibliographer gave me this great example of how uh, 
uh, pre-1917 publications uh, for Russian materials uh, had to be treated and, and uh, approached in very different ways. Um, it turns out that uh, 100 years ago tomorrow on May 11th, that's tomorrow, right? May 11th, uh, 1917, um, the Soviets, of course, wanted to uh, uh, remove as much of the czarist um, history as possible, and they created a group that I think I see some coin people in the crowd, some PCC steering people in the crowd, a great group for the PCC. It sounds exactly like what we would do now, the Assembly for Considering Simplification of the Orthography. Doesn't that sound like a group the PCC would form uh, reporting to the Standing Committee on Standards or something like that? Um, so they wanted to modernize the language after the czarist period. So if a book was written, written uh, pre-1917 uh, orthography for in Russian, uh, the, the bibliographers, the, the uh, subject specialists, the public uh, services librarians, uh, over time had to, including now, this metadata is still represented in North American databases, certainly in WorldCat, to the extent that it has really never been harmonized and in our lib guide for this collection, there is still a note that says, if you want to determine if we have a pre-1917 publication in our online catalog or a database such as WorldCat, you will have to retransliterate the Soviet title back into the old orthography to find it. And so whether you like it or not, you have to be a linguist to get to some of this data. And what surprised me about this was we keep trying to uncover hidden collections all the time, even ones we have cataloged, um, but are not really um, usable or findable. And certainly this um, came to the fore for me when I was talking to my colleagues. Certainly also for this part of the, the world, there were um, different um, uh, histories and practices governing transliteration. And um, I learned from my colleagues that that scholarly transliteration was actually quite different from the transliteration developed by the Library of Congress. And so even now, as our researchers look at those uh, early source materials, um, we are retransliterating re a lot of these things between uh, the various schemes. Uh, the words um, identity politics, this is Washington, so you know, uh, come, tum, tum, come, come to the news media all the time, it's a catchy phrase, but um, uh, certainly uh, reflected, this is just one example of one country in, in less than a century, how many times it changed its, its identity and its names. And, and a colleague, I wrote her quote from an email she sent me, said, corporate entries in the card catalog told the entire history of an institution, uh, be that a, a government or, or a country or any other corporate body. All of these nuances of the deep impact of the evolutions of our language, culture, politics, geographies, the identities of our people, um, were not only reflected in our card catalog, but required a much deeper connection uh, between the cataloging operations and the public services operations of the library than we do now. And one of the things that I meant to bring with me, but I didn't, was a, a manual that was created really by the um, catalogers to help reference staff understand how to navigate the catalog. And now we think you search, and that's a, when you use the word search, you think type. Uh, but searching the catalog was an intensely physical activity back then and, and required knowing not just how the catalog worked, but many other reference tools like the NUC and so forth. Um, sorry, Susan also asked me to talk about whether Chicago was ever a customer of LC's cards. And um, folklore has it we did get the cards, but not for the card catalog, for selectors to make uh, purchase decisions. Uh, I don't know if they were the same cards that we would have put in the card catalog, but uh, it, what, what, the, what the problem was was that the, our ability to use LC's cards really came down to this tiny little square footage on the card, um, the call number. Um, we built our collections um, 
at times well LCC classification was still being developed and um, there was decades of history of catalogers building local classification schemes for our collections that was very hard to give up and we uh, someone used the word intellectual contributions earlier and um, certainly there would have been a deep connection to that work um, and I would imagine lent, lent uh, led to us being so delayed in becoming uh, an OCLC member. We did not join OCLC until 1989. Um, so most of our copy cataloging, if we did it, came through the tape loads from LC. But we also weren't contributing our original cataloging until uh, quite late. And um, so those deep traditions, the expertise in cataloging that Chicago acquired over time. Uh, then also, as soon as we went on to OCLC, I think that spirit of cooperation and, um, and sharing took hold. We joined the PCC. And I did get a chance to, to read the book a couple of days ago. And one of the histories I learned in there was that Charles Cutter attempted to do something that I think the PCC and certainly all of its participating libraries, mine even this week uh, itself, uh, trying to get better metadata directly from publishers as close to the time of publishing as possible. And uh, if I can quote you for a second in the book, I thought it was great. Uh, quote, the plan was to goad publishers into working <laughs> with Charles Cutter on cataloging their own books through insertion of a paper slip containing the bibliographic information that could be used by libraries. The response from libraries was tepid. I was going to make you insert the blank, but I'll give you a pass. Um, they viewed the scheme with skepticism and doubted it would provide the final answers to their cataloging needs. So I don't know when that happened, but certainly a long time ago. And uh, more proof that the more things change, the more they stay the same. We still struggle with that one. <coughs> Um, so we certainly, of course, this book is about the, mostly about the public catalog, but I'm a technical services person, and I wanted to know what was managing the card catalog like on the back end. Certainly we had gigantic shelf lists. Um, <clears throat> and one of my staff, uh, our head of serials, Renee Martinick, showed me uh, this holdings card from the University of Chicago serials department. It is uh, for an annual report, uh, a check-in card for the annual report from the town clerk, presumably from Sydney, Australia. It doesn't say Australia on it. Um, and we see that it was regularly being received through 1989 in, a, in unbound status. And at some point, there's blanks, right? So by the absence of data, you can assume we stopped getting it. And uh, then you can also assume someone was curious, where is all this stuff, and, and tried to claim it. I don't know if they would have called it claiming back then, but that's what we would call it now. And you see um, there's, a, there's a handwritten note at the bottom of the card dated 2-1-1941. Uh, it's not in ISO format, so I can't tell you whether that means February 1st or January 2nd. It's got a Roman numeral in it. Uh, that's probably a convention for something. I can't tell you uh, what. Uh, but that note says, um, will be forwarded at end of war. And... Um, <laughs> I think what was so fascinating about that was preserved in these catalog cards, um, even the, just the management side of things, um, are these realities of information flow through our histories during times of global conflict, and clearly how difficult it was to relay information and get publications um, during a period of time of, of conflict. But um, interestingly, in, in a part of the world you don't normally think of as being the theater of war at that particular time, clearly uh, a challenge nonetheless. Um, I could go into a story about the abbreviation for the word analytics, but I will, <laughs> considering the esteemed venue, I will not, but I will tell you that last month I mandated that all 250-something thousand instances of that abbreviation be spelled out in full in our catalog, <laughs> uh, because we display the entire mark record now, and um, I did not want that in there, so we got rid of that. Um, 
<laughs> so this was another note shared with me uh, from the shelf list um, that demonstrates that the future is indeed longer than the past and the struggles that our colleagues faced back then um, were at their core the same that we struggle with now. Um, this is a note that, that said, you know, we really want to do analytics for this and we will do it if ever any time. And uh, I think what we have learned is there will really never be more time. time. As, a, as a cataloging manager who has uh, inherited the sins of many forefathers, poor judgment in, in treatment decisions, I can say, we no longer kid ourselves that there will be no more time. We either do it or we don't do it. Um, lastly, I would love to uh, thank you all for listening. I want to uh, thank you for inviting me to speak this event, uh, if only because it provided me with an important reminder uh, of the history of my profession, the history of my library, for giving me another reason to appreciate um, the precious few of my colleagues remaining in my organization who remember what um, it was like and have that historical and institutional knowledge of how we essentially became who and what we are today. One of them, I want to just put her picture up, is June Ferris. She is our Slavic and Eastern European bibliographer. I got many, many, many stories from her, some so scandalous I couldn't even uh, <laughs> repeat them to you today. Um, partly because they involved the Library of Congress. Um, <laughs> the juiciest ones really did. Um, this historical knowledge, this connection to our past is at grave risk as our colleagues retire and these histories retire with them and this book that Elsie has published will in no short measure um, ensure that those mem memories of our cataloging humanity, perhaps even a few strands of our cataloging uh, DNA will be captured in there forevermore and I want to thank the Library of Congress for that as well. It's been a great privilege. Thank you so much. I'm a little taller than that. <laughs> <clears throat> I'm Kathy Widrell, and I'm here to talk about using the main card catalog in reference work. <clears throat> so, let's see. It's this. Oh, it's this. Thank you. So between 1802 and 1879, the library had produced at least 57 printed catalogs. I won't be reading to you the entire time, let me assure you. Um, when the Jefferson Building opened in 1897, there was no complete or current catalog, and the Librarian of Congress at the time, John Russell Young, stated that a library without a catalog is like a ship without a rudder. The main reading room staff did have a small drawer compiled with entries clipped from these various catalogs that was kept behind the desk. Much reliance was placed on the staff to remember the books in the collection. By 1900, a dictionary catalog containing 90,000 cards in the, was on the floor in the main reading room. And by 1920, the catalog had grown. Between 1920 and 1950, the card catalog occupied a quarter of the main reading room and it grew to fill the current reference assistance room that you see pictured here on the right, the machine and electronic resources center, that's what we call it currently, and the hallway between the two. When the catalog was closed in 1980, it had 22,000 drawers and 22 million cards. In 1990 or 89, the catalog was moved to two deck areas off of the main reading room. And because the Carnegie steel shelving in the Jefferson Building actually provides structural support for the building, the circular card, ca card catalog cases that were in the main reading room couldn't be used. And um, so we appealed, the library appealed to libraries around the country to send us their card catalog cases, cabinets, since they weren't using them anymore, and we received many of those. Now the card catalog is on decks 16 and 33, just off of the main reading room. These images show one aisle of the main catalog 
um, card catalog on deck 33, and part of the shelves housing just A through P um, on the right. Because the cabinets were received from a variety of different libraries, the catalog is not aesthetically pleasing, but it is fully functional. And here are some caveats for fully functional. Uh, with 22 million cards, a misfiled card is a lost card, and a lost card can be a lost item. Over the years, sometimes researchers will just rip the card out of the card catalog to bring it to us so we can retrieve it for them. <laughs> or they take the card to show their uncle that his book actually is in the Library of Congress. Um, in the movie J. Edgar, which was filmed it, at the Library of Congress, Leonardo DiCaprio is actually shown ripping a card out of the card catalog. Several years ago, we discovered that all of the subject cards for birds had disappeared and had to be replaced. When I began in the main reading room, I was assigned a terrific mentor, Tom Mann. 28 years later, he still has lessons for me. But one of my first lessons was red-tipped cards are subject cards. <laughs> For many years, we were under the impression, actually, until I started working on this presentation, that those numbers in the card catalog that look like fractions were actually Jefferson numbers. And here's an example of a card that, with the call number that looks like a fraction. There were two people who could convert them. I remember one of their names, Jefferson numbers converted. Who you're going to call? Sigrid Milner. Um, I'm sure she's no longer here, but you could call one of these two people from the reference desk and they would give you the accurate call number for the book that had that fraction. So I'm so hoping some of you who are catalogers will be able to, to explain this fractional system. I don't recognize it. Um, so, but you can see um, in this card that the number has been crossed out and the new call number has been replaced. As long as you don't ask me after when we finish. <laughs> yes, sir. <laughs> um, I wanted to talk, tell you some stories about some of the people who've come to request help um, and had to use the card catalog. A few of my colleagues worked with a researcher who was a handwriting specialist and he came to the Library of Congress to study the library hand, as found in the main card catalogs. In the 1880s, much was written about handwriting by Mel Melville Dewey, the American Library Association, and by Charles Cutter, now known to us primarily as the part of the call number after the period. <laughs> <coughs> so, um, Prior to 1887, Melville Dewey began to promote library handwriting, or the library hand, as it was also called, he preferred the vertical style. He was interested in speed, efficiency, and um, legibility. Should you be interested in library hand, or for that matter, telegraph hand, railway hand, or telegram hand, those all actually exist, you can see David Kaminsky's website. I've included it on the slide, so you can, um, and, and I will say that the article on library hand is actually quite interesting, so. Another story involving my colleague, Abby Yokelson. A few years ago, she got a written letter from a researcher who was compiling a bibliography on author Wilkie Collins. He had seen an entry in the National Union Catalog for an edition of Collins' Woman in White, the tale of an amorphous woman who had escaped from an asylum. Elsie was listed as the only owning library. In March of 2006, Abby first found the NUC entry, and then she searched the card catalog. On the card was a handwritten note that I've circled on this, and it says, not found. As Abby examined the card, a chill wind blew through the deck <laughs> as she realized that the note had been written 100 years ago to the day. 
been dealing with pre-MARC records for a long time, and one of the ways that we deal with pre-MARC records is by going to the card catalog to see where the mistake was made. <laughs> I always heard that pre-MARC was actually input by Scottish clerks or Scottish housewives, um, but, um, and I don't actually know that. Much was actually lost in translation, so I'm making a bit of a joke here, but things were lost in translation. Um, the cards in the card catalog often include content notes, series records, holdings records, cross-references, records for uniform titles, automated records derived from them were often created using a limited profile of transferable information, and the um, automated format often dropped unique characteristics and sometimes eliminated file information. Um, copy catalog protocols for machine-readable records often eschewed local information in, in um, looking for other information. So issues with Premark, and I have an example here of something called Porcupine's Political Sensor. Um, you'll notice on the card that it says office. That was an early designation for rare book, and that is indeed where this is. But I wanted to show you the other cards behind this card and all the information that was kept on each of these cards. So the online catalog, catalog record for the political censor does indicate that there are four rare book collections where this title can be found, but much of the information on these cards is now missing. To effectively respond to a query involving older materials, it's essential to consult the main card catalog and perhaps divisional catalogs, the copyright card catalog, the shelf list, the microform catalog, the national union catalog, bibliographies, reference sources, and colleagues. Using these and other sources in concert is invaluable. When assisting researchers seeking historical information, the card catalog is an essential element. It is the authority for anything published prior to 1968. And many people don't realize that the first two aisles of the catalog hold just periodical titles, and those records are duplicated in the main card catalog. Um, so these are just some examples um, that, of things that are found in the catalog. Um, so, many items in the catalog aren't reflected in the online catalog, and many, many of the library's foreign language materials and periodicals in foreign languages are only found in the card catalog. The things, older things that have been converted are primarily English language. In addition, um, changed subject headings is a very important topic. Um, for example, um, uh, aeroplanes was the, when, used to be the term, we now use airplanes. M moving pictures is now motion pictures. Negroes is now African Americans. There's so many examples of changed subject terms, but in the area of the card catalog, we keep two, two copies of the ninth edition of Library of Congress subject headings. That is the edition that was in place when the catalog was closed. Since there is no global search and replace in the card catalog, we are reliant on those older terms for identifying older materials. And the card here shows the previous term for Auschwitz, um, which I would never have been able to spell. Um, so I want to tell you a story about um, a card catalog success. Um, in which I was assigned a question from a woman in Texas named Gretchen. She wanted to find a, a, another woman named Eileen. They were pen pals when they were young teenagers. And the only information she had was this. Eileen had contracted polio, and Gretchen had read an article about Eileen in a magazine published sometime in the late 1940s or early 1950s. She remembered Eileen's address, but not her last name. 
or any other information. She didn't remember the name of the journal or the date. So step one, I had an address. I determined that the apartment building in New York City where Eileen had lived had been raised. It was now a parking lot. So then I went to the Reader's Guide for Periodical Literature and started looking for articles about a young girl who was recovering from polio. I found no entries. I then used a reference book that listed magazines produced for women's interest to identify titles that were available around 1950. Most of those titles were either not indexed or partially indexed. I then used the card catalog to get call numbers for several of those possible titles. Are you, are you getting the fact that I can be like a dog with a bone um, <laughs> with a reference question? Because I can. Um, so I started looking. I went to the stacks and I eliminated many journal titles and looked at more tables of contents than I care to admit. There was one bound volume of the Ladies' Home Companion missing from the stacks, but the space was there. So I kept watching and returning, and finally, after about two months, the volume was on the shelf again. I opened it up. The table of contents said that the article was in that journal. I was so excited. When I turned to the page, it had been razor bladed out. Oh. So, I found another library that had that article, and I had, it was North Texas State University Library. I had them send the article to Gretchen. Gretchen, when she received the article, called to say um, what Eileen's last name had been, and fortunately, it was Dicek, somewhat unusual, and not Jones. So I was able to find a brother just using the internet, and I reunited Eileen and Gretchen after more than 50 years. Aww. <laughs> thank you. And, and thanks to the card catalog. <laughs> Although we no longer have the beautiful cases that formerly resided in the main reading room, we have all the information included in them. So please, come to, the, to come to the main reading room, use the card catalog, and there's a current picture of it. Although not an option for the Library of Congress, libraries that have gotten rid of their card catalogs are doing really creative things. And so even though they're no longer in use, this is, a, this is a, our images from the San Francisco Public Library. They hired an artist to um, get people to draw on different cards that meant something to them. And the upper floor in the San Francisco Public Library is wallpapered with these artistic cards. Here are other examples of art and creativity workshops at libraries um, using catalog cards. Here's an organization called the Library as Incubator Project. With that um, card catalog corset. <laughs> Who knew? Um, and here is one from Columbus State University with um, all kinds of creativity made out of um, card catalog cards, as it looks like, as well as um, cards, the, the checkout cards. So, as the decorative arts specialist, I would be remiss not to share exciting possibilities for card catalog cabinets and cases. And you might ask, where would I get such a thing? Well, there's always the magic of eBay, <laughs> Google, Craigslist, Etsy, flea markets. And that will allow you to find organizational zeal. Look at all the things that people have put in their card catalogs. And you can keep track of your items. Um, and if you insist on using your card catalog alphabetically, there's all, also always <laughs> Aste Spumante to Zinfandel. So on behalf of the card catalog off of the main reading room and myself, I would like to thank you. Well, 
I can't compete with wine in a in a, in a <laughs> catalog card um, a card catalog. But um, I'm going to talk a little bit about how we at Princeton are using RDF vocabularies such as BibFrame, which Beecher mentioned. Um, to um, explore relationships in the inscribed and annotated materials that um, we found in the library of Jacques Derrida um, and what we're doing to help expose those relationships in the form of linked data on the semantic web. So a little over um, two years ago, Princeton University acquired the personal working library of Jacques Derrida, who um, was an Algerian-born French philosopher who is um, considered probably one of the foremost thinkers of the 20th century. This acquisition was significant for us because um, the library consists of about 16,000 items, including books and other material, and um, Derrida's library was pretty much an immersive environment, meaning that it, it, it represents his sort of lifetime of reading. For Derrida, the um, act of reading was not really a passive process. He was actively engaged in, in what he was reading and he annotated much of it. Um, these annotations included everything from marginalia to dog-eared and, and um, paper-clipped pages and pages with post-it notes and other inserted material. In addition, many of the books in Derrida's library are actually presentation volumes bearing personal inscriptions from other philosophers and theorists, as well as from a wide range of admirers. To date, we've identified about 6,300 books that have personal inscriptions. These inscriptions give us a glimpse into Derrida's global social and intellectual network. Perhaps equally important, if not more so, is the fact that Derrida himself annotated many of these inscribed volumes. He took note of where others um, mentioned him in the books, and he often annotated those particular pages. As a result, we're able to gain additional insight into his reactions about what others were saying about him, because like most authors um, and writers, Derrida cared a lot about what other people said about him. So as we've seen from the um, previous presentations, we've, we ha libraries have a long history of organizing information, both for the purpose of pre preserving knowledge and also for making that knowledge available to anyone searching for it. We've made significant strides in organizing information, beginning with simple lists um, of books engraved on clay tab tablets to the rich descriptive data found in our online discovery systems. The next logical step, then, is to share that rich data on the web so that its value can be appreciated beyond the library. Unfortunately, one of the biggest obstacles to exposing library data on the web is, uh, in the way that the web can actually understand it, is our reliance on the MARC format to encode our data. MARC has served us really quite well for half a century, but Libraries are pretty much the only industry using MARC, so our data doesn't play well with everybody else's data on the web. So we need to move away from MARC to a framework that allows us to create machine actionable data that is persistent and easily understood by web crawlers. So currently, we present data to library users through our online discovery systems. In addition, for archival collections, we create finding aids that give more detail about collections than we can include in our bibliographic descriptions. At Princeton, the finding aid for Derrida's library presents the material in the order that he left it. As far as we know, um, some of it arrived in boxes out of order, and anyway, it was kind of a mess, but anyway, um, which is useful for researchers because, again, it emphasizes the context and is, gives them an idea of his social networks. Um, but the problem with finding aids, just like with bibliographic records encoding and in, in, encoded in MARC, much of the data in the finding aid, uses, which uses encoded archival description, is mostly textual. For the Derrida Library, our rare books and special collections staff created identifiers to reflect the original shelf order of the material, meaning which wall the, material, the book was on, which case, which case on the wall, which shelf, and what position on the shelf. So this is really interesting to researchers because you know, um, they, can, they can see, oh, we've got vampire diaries next to um, death and transfiguration next to, you know, um, 
Fifty Shades of Grey, I'm making up stuff. <laughs> but, but by being able to see how things were shelved, people, the researchers can deduce, you know, maybe, or you know, come up with assumptions about what he was thinking or what he might have been working on at the time he received a particular volume. But the problem with those identifiers is that with EAD, the encoded archival description, the identifiers are basically just kind of stuck in what's basically a big ordered list. And so the types of querying that needs to be done um, isn't easily done. So this is where we are right now. We have rich data about library resources and collections, but that data has mostly been captured in text strings in a format that most of the web does not understand. So I'll talk a little bit more about Derrida in a minute, but let's go back to the online catalog. So online catalogs contain rich information about the resources we've been curating for centuries. What if, though, we were able to create an enhanced discovery environment for users from the wealth of non-library data sources on the web that describe those same works, people, and other entities that we represent in our catalogs? We can use linked data to help us get there. Some libraries are already experimenting with enhancing their discovery systems with information pulled in from resources outside of the library. What if we could pull in data from Wikipedia directly into our online catalog, like I have shown on this mock-up in the middle of the page? Or what if we could provide visual representations of the relationships between authors when a user does a search by author? Perhaps we could create APIs that could display interactive graphs of relationships for our users directly from within our online catalogs. The possibilities for serendipitous discovery suddenly become limitless. In order to reach the point of creating enhanced discovery environments for our users, as well as reaching the point where our carefully crafted and curated and nurtured library data is exposed on the open web, we need to free that data. We need to free it from the confines of the library so that a user searching the web will not only retrieve results from commercial enterprises such as Amazon.com, but will see links to resources held by institutions like the Library of Congress or University of Chicago or Princeton. Once we do this, we will have paved the way for new knowledge creation. The project we're working on at Princeton with Derrida's library aims to create a set of data that can be used by researchers and scholars to learn more about Derrida and his social and global intellectual network and to easily answer potential research questions such as, which inscriptions did Derrida make comments on? Or Derrida is not known for his works on religion, so where did he get all of these books on Judaism? Once we record the data using persistent identifiers instead of strings of text and model it using a standard such as the Resource Description Framework, or RDF, which is the standard model used for um, exchanging data on the web, we will be able to publish that data on the open web so that it can be used by others however they may wish. Perhaps a researcher is interested in finding out what kinds of people were sending books to Derrida we might be able to assist that research by, create, by creating an interface um, driven by linked data that will allow her to form complex queries about the items in Derrida's library. Or perhaps another researcher is interested in seeing visualizations that show the geographic locations of people who sent books to Derrida and how these changed over time. That researcher could take the persistent identifier from names we've coded in our bibliographic descriptions pull in data for geographic locations from something like GeoNames, and then import all of this into a spreadsheet, upload the spreadsheet into an online to tool such as Palladio, which was created at Stanford, and this would allow that researcher to visualize and analyze the relationships over time. But back to our question of how we might get there. The approach we're using at Princeton is two-pronged. For the inscriptions, we're using the web annotation data model, which is the official, which um, actually became a, an official World Wide Web Consortium recommendation earlier this year. For the bibliographic data that describe the books in Derrida's library, we're using Bibframe. We found that the core purpose of the web annotation data model fits well with the Derrida material. The model states, 
Annotations are typically used to convey information about a resource or associations between resources. For our purposes, the, the inscription itself is an annotation. So the inscription is a body, and then the publication in which the inscription is written is the target. So then we have a model that we can work with and use that web annotation data model. So I mentioned earlier that Derrida sometimes annotated the books he received as gifts. Here's one of um, our favorite inscriptions from the collection that we came across when we were um, digitizing the, the inscriptions. Um, you can see that um, Derrida has indicated his opinion of the Dedicare um, by writing hypocrite with an exclamation point to the left of the transcription. And this was actually an interesting case in modeling because not only do we have the one annotation being the inscription of the book to Derrida, but then we have Derrida's um, shade <laughs> on that particular person as another annotation. By using the web annotation data model and RDF, we're able to capture the relationships between the work that was given to Derrida, the person who sent the work, and Derrida himself in such a way that the data can be represented as a collection of statements about those relationships, each with a subject, a predicate, and an object. These are called triple statements because they have three parts. And the premise of linked data is that the subject of one triple can be the object of another triple. So this is, uh, I don't know if you've seen like those linked data graphs with just like all these lines and circles. This is, what, this is what is driving linked data, these relationships. You have an object and a subject connected with a predicate and then there's another subject that's the same as this object. And then we start to have more complex relationships that we can't easily see in our bibliographic data that we have today. So, and also because each triple statement will have a unique identifier, a computer can derive meaning from those statements in a way that's impossible with text streams. Another thing that we, um, and I thought about this, uh, this wasn't part of my presentation, so I'm digressing. Um, when we were taught, when we were um, learning about sort of the history of the card catalog, I remembered at Princeton we got rid of our card catalog a few years ago and a lot of professors were really upset about it going away because for many of them that was their first place for research and their area of expertise, what you'd go to that section of the card catalog and see just just documents, I mean, written on the back of the cards, on in the margins and everything. And we've lost that, when, we lost that when we went to the online catalog. And what's nice about the web annotation data model and the, the idea of going forward with linked data is that we could potentially provide a way for researchers to start annotating the way they did the card catalog because the web annotation data model is set up where a person can make an assertion about a thing and show the provenance of that, of that statement. So again, it brings it back to having the researchers and scholars more intimately associated with the, the catalog records. So that's another exciting thing that I thought of while I was sitting there that doesn't have anything to do with what's there. <laughs> so using BibFrame, which um, is, I, it's in, in its second version right now, will allow us to describe the gift books in Derry Dawes Library using, again, using triples um, with persistent identifiers, which are critical in order for linked data to actually work. We are actually able to put persistent identifiers in MARC, and a lot of libraries, including Princeton, are beginning to add these persistent identifiers called URIs to their bibliographic records in preparation for linked data. But the key difference between BibFrame and MARC is that BibFrame uses RDF, the Resource Description Framework conventions, and MARC does not. So BibFrame is able to communicate, if you will, with the rest of the web where MARC is not. New data models expressed in RDF are necessary in order to shift to the linked data environment we're counting on to help us free our data so that it can be used in new and interesting ways and provide enhanced discovery environments for library users. BibFrame is the model that Princeton and other ex experimenters are using to realize this future for library data on the semantic web. Thank you.
Well, thank you, everyone. Um, uh, no doubt everyone has something to take away from the presentation today. Are there any thoughts from any of the presenters? Um, Jennifer folded hers into her presentation as she was um, talking. Anything striking of the rest of you listening to the others of you speak before we ask if the audience has any questions or comments? I'm just thankful that I deleted the last slide of my presentation, <laughs> which was a picture of a card catalog from our collection that is now used to store wine uh, at, at my friend's house. So uh, I didn't step on your toes with that. <laughs> questions or comments from the audience? Yes. There seems to be a spate of articles in chiefly online publications such as Atlas Obscura and Mental Floss who seem to have just discovered now card catalogs. Atlas Obscura wrote a long one, you will appreciate this, about how the card catalog, catalog of the Library of Congress is gathering dust in the basement. And I'm thinking, actually, I kind of use that every day in rare materials to verify holdings. And if it's gathering dust, it's because someone doesn't clean it. And the mental floss article, again, seemed to have discovered catalog cards in general and just waxed rhapsodic about the amount of detail found on said cards. And while part of me thinks, well, it's great that cataloging in general and metadata creation is getting sort of wider attention, on the other hand, I have concerns that the, the manner in which this is treated makes it sound as though, A, we don't include that kind of detail anymore, which we do, and not annotations, but the act in actual cataloging, and B, that what we do is some kind of arcane lost art that is no longer practiced. And again, in my opinion, anything that makes us sound like we're practicing an arcane lost art leads to things like, oh, we don't need libraries anymore. They just do those lovely historic things like write card catalogs in nifty hand. And I was wondering how you felt about what seems to be the, even prior to the book, the sort of reemergence of the card catalog and catalog cards in sort of popular culture. I, I would just like to say uh, I spoke with uh, Tom Mann um, huh. at length uh, during in writing this book, and I think the quote's in the book, and he wanted to make clear that the cards were not kept, as he said, I think, uh, for the texture of the wood and the sort of nostalgia. He, he, he wanted to you know, emphasize their continued utility for uh, cataloging and reference staff here at the library. So I, I hope that does come through uh, in the book. Jennifer. Of course, I have to respond to my friend Deb. Uh, but um, I think one of the problems, I mean, one of the reasons that there's this perception that we're doing, that we're not doing the same thing anymore is because we hide so much of it in our online catalogs because we've assumed that the users don't want to see that. They want the Google experience with a blank screen. When they get the search result, they just want the title and the call number so they can go to the stacks. So we've, we've hidden so much information that I think there might even be a, a, a whole generation of people who don't realize the work that actually still goes into creating a bibliographic description. And, and since you know, they're able to go to Google and find things, they don't realize the intellectual work that goes into creating descriptions. Because I, and I think that's one way we, we've kind of shot ourselves in the foot and we're having to make ourselves, trying to make ourselves relevant now because we, we've hidden so much of that work. Yes. Mm -hmm. So I also work in the main reading room with Kathy, and uh, somebody up there mentioned institutional memory. And Kathy had mentioned David Kaminsky coming in and looking at our catalog in terms of library hand. It was fascinating because he was pretty sure he could identify which library school various catalogers had gone to based on the style of handwriting. It was amazing to me. But uh, Pre-days of cell phone cameras, we used to occasionally have to give people permission to take out the rod from the catalog and, and photocopy a catalog, and he had very good reason for needing to do that, so we started to carefully uh, take these apart. Kathy had mentioned it's a hodgepodge 
of catalog cases and drawers and kinds of things. And I think we came up with five or six different methods to get the rods out. And one was really simple, you just unscrewed it, and another one had a, like a hidden button. But there are also keys. There are a couple of different kinds of ways of loosening the rod. And uh, Cheryl Adams inherited some of these keys when Sheridan Harvey retired. And, and we had to be around to get the keys or open the catalog, and I can't even remember how to do most of them. So we decided, in terms of succession planning and institutional memory, at a uh, staff meeting, we needed to train some of our younger colleagues. So we brought in all the drawers and all the keys and, and taught everyone how to use them. because. It just doesn't come up very often, but when it does, you need to know how to open those drawers. So. Yeah, yeah, if I could add to that, I, uh, Kay Giles and uh, Tom Yee, I, I spoke uh, with both of them when I was writing this book, and I forget which one, but they told a story of there used to be, um, back in the day, staff members who would stand by the card catalogs when somebody would pull a rod out and knock the whole drawer over and the cards would go everywhere. Yeah. They were masters of quickly refiling the cards in the correct <laughs> order and getting the rod back in there. <laughs> There is a question there and here. Hi, I'm just curious about the the, uh, the the workflow. Once Mark was being put, let's say in 1969 or 1970, you know, not everybody was going to be doing the actual cataloging uh, on, on a, a key punching it the information. The card catalog was still being typed up. What was the workflow that th that information was going to be inputted into a machine readable system and then? And, in other words, this, what was the, you know, how, would, how did, what was the workflow? You had a book, you had, because the card was still being put, it, still being created, but you had Mark, which was machine readable. What was that kind of connection? Well, I'm going to speak from memory now, because when I came in, I was cataloging and we were using cards. They weren't three by five, but they were twice that, so it's probably like four by six. And so we catalogers typed information on that, and we had a separate, division, um, mock editorial division, I believe was its name, at least in one um, guise. And so all of those cards, if you will, flowed to that division and there was staff who then did the keying into the system. That system generated um, information that produced the card, the cards themselves that were done by at that time, still I think it was called the card distribution um, division, I believe it was. And so everything flowed from catalogers starting with the input process, going through uh, the creation process, the intellectual process, then the input process in the Mark Editorial Division and format and structure, then that flowing on to the uh, card distribution service and the card division. That was one iteration. Then it moved on to uh, we had dumb terminals and we finally could actually input the data into um, something that had no intellectual understanding of what was happening, it was just sucking it in, going someplace else, and then that would spew out the end products. And then I think maybe by the 80s or 90s, we each had um, uh, intellectual uh, desktops that actually took the things and we could then manipulate and do searching and all that kind of thing. So it was an evolution, sort of evolved at the same rate of the mark format itself from print through probably the first decade of 15 years to the special format, sound recordings, um, cartographic materials and whatnot. Um, so that's a very high level way it flowed at that time here at the library. Uh, one more question, so people can at least gather a little bit for the reception. Hi. Long before the Mark II project, there was a Mark pilot project, right. which was a completely different format. The tag was right next to the field itself. There was no directory. Uh, before even that, Henriette had contracted with Larry Buckland at Inferonics to do a study of the, this area and what the details were, I cannot say at this point. Right, I had some of all that detail, but I didn't want to go into it for this. I just wanted to keep it at a high level, but yes, she, believe me, she told me about every one of those. And, <laughs> and if I got it wrong, if I was trying to describe or write some article for her, 
I knew it by the next day. So <laughs> yes, there were lots of intricacies and they went to various pilot stages and recon projects and some of them got funded and, and evolved into something permanent and some uh, went by the way. The only thing that was constant was the constant evolution of the format itself and more and more becoming ingrained in the library world on what we're doing. On that then, we will um, end and in the, oh, I'll, thank you, Sam. <laughs> yeah, I want to uh, take a moment to thank all of our speakers. It was just a fabulous program. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.